You know, one thing I've learned just over many, many years of trial and error and God shaping me and then trying to shape me and me oftentimes resisting is this. You and I, we grow stronger, we grow more mature, we develop strength in our relationships, all in the storms of life. In fact, outside of the storms of life, many of us aren't going to grow. Outside of the storms of life, many of us aren't going to be stretched. We're we're not going to move. We're not going to move past things in our life that God wants to surface and remove. And outside of the storms of life, some of us are going to stay immature. But the storms of life, as, as much as we don't like them, in fact, are what God uses to shape us and to grow us. You know, for example, Jesus would get his disciples in a storm. You know, I I often wondered in Mark chapter 6 or Mark chapter 4 or through the Gospels where Jesus gets his disciples into this huge storm where they think they're going to die. And then he walks by them like he's going to pass them by, almost just kind of nonchalantly. And what's he doing? He's shaping them in the storms. And they're all freaking out in the boat and they're screaming and they're crying and, uh, and they're worried and they're all anxious. But Jesus is showing them that he wants them to trust in him even in the storms. And what he's doing is he's preparing them. He's preparing them for other storms that don't necessarily involve weather that they're going to go through. You know, you've got in the Bible where God shapes people in storms that last a long time. You've got Abraham who waits on God for decades. You've got Moses who waits on God for decades. You've got Joseph who gets a vision from God, and God gets him in a place after his brothers betray him where he's a slave. And where for 13 years, he is in a long, protracted storm, and, and, and it's just, he's full of anguish in this storm. But God uses that anguish to grow Joseph and to move him into where he needs to be. And so you've got 13 years with Joseph. You've got David, who is anointed king of Israel, but yet for 13 years he's on the run from the existing king, King Saul, running for his life. But what's happening is he's hiding in those caves, as he's running for his life, he's in this protracted 13-year storm, but God is shaping his character. God is building him, God is defining him, and he's growing into the person that now God can use. Or you've got Paul. Paul comes to Christ, he's got faith in Jesus, and, and he's just on fire, and he's full of this unbridled passion, and he's full of this unbridled just desire to see others come to to faith, but yet he hasn't yet grown through his immaturities. And so what does God do? He puts him in a storm, a storm involving rejection, a storm involving basically moving home to Tarsus where the church kind of sends him off and he blesses the church and the leaving. And Paul has 13 years of anguish where he's saying, God, what's all this for? But yet God uses that storm, that protracted anguish to grow him and to shape him and to really mold him into whom God wants. And that's, that's what we see. And so you've got these, these 13 years of, of anguish of Joseph and 13 years of anguish with David and 13 years of anguish with Paul. And I think there's something there that God is letting us know. Sometimes he allows us to wander into a storm. Sometimes, sometimes he allows the storm to overwhelm us. But it's only to shape us. It's only to grow us. He, there is no maturity in Scripture outside of the storm. There, there, there is no health, spiritual health, in Scripture outside of the storm. Had Paul just kept going without the storm, he would have alienated everybody. He, he, he wasn't emotionally where he needed to be. God had to grow him and shape him into a spiritual and emotional maturity that he had to develop within the storms. That there's a book I highly recommend. It's by... Victor and Mildred Gertzel. It's called Cradles of Eminence. And what they have done is they've gone and they have, they have taken 392 people who helped shape this world in some form or fashion. And their hypothesis is this, and it, was, and it proves true and all, that the people that God used or the people that were able to affect this world for the better all had to go through serious storms and serious anguish. And what they're saying is that what storms do What anguish does in our life is to grow us, if we allow God to do it, to to shape us, to mold us, to make us even stronger. And and here we get to the church in Acts chapter 12. And so if you've been following along in this series, let me encourage you to 
join in in Acts chapter 12 with your Bible or your Bible app and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take you through most of Acts chapter 12 and you know what it's all about it's all about storms it's all about a storm that comes upon this early church in the form of a famine and we saw that last week with Agabus predicting and prophesying that a famine was coming and so the church of Antioch raises money to send to Jerusalem instead of hoarding they share even though they're all going to get hit by the famine. And the second storm comes in the form of persecution. James, the brother of John, is beheaded. And Herod Antipas decides, you know what? People like that. Maybe I'm going to do this some more. And persecution breaks out. And so you've got this incredible persecution that breaks out on the heels of this famine that God is letting people know they're going to go through. And the church is in a storm. So they're going through great anguish. I mean, you might imagine. You've got a dearly loved friend who is now beheaded and killed, who is murdered, but God has you in a storm. Ultimately, what God will do is God will use this storm. He didn't cause it, but he will use it to make them stronger. He will use it to make them unstoppable. He will use it to forge their character. He will use it to, to forge their relationships with each other. He will use it to forge their dependence on him. So, anybody in a storm today, whether you're here or at home, anybody in a storm, raise your hands. Okay, let me address the storm. There are four things that you need to do if you're in a storm. And if you're not in a storm, you probably will be at some point soon. And so you'll need these notes, jot these things down. I need to pray for God's provision if I'm in a storm. I need to receive God's peace. I need to expect God's power. And I need to trust God's plan. Four Ps we're looking at today. And the first one is pray for God's provision. So if I'm in a storm, I need to pray. Uh, And what am I praying for? I'm praying directly that God would meet me and provide for me in the midst of this storm. So here we are in Acts chapter 12. Let's go ahead and begin with verse 1. Follow along with me as we read through this. It was about this time, verse 1 says, that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. It's the time of the famine that is, being proce- that is being prophesied. So you've got a famine, and here now you have persecution. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that it met with the approval among the Jews, he proceeded to arrest and seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of the unleavened bread. And so here he's thinking, uh, I, I can do this. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to now win popularity points by persecuting the church. Now, let me tell you a bit about who Herod Antipas is. If you look it up in, in history, his name is Herod Antipas. He is the grandson of Herod the Great. You'll remember Herod the Great, who wasn't so great, because he, per- he persecuted the babies when Jesus was born. So you remember the story of Bethlehem and Jesus is born, and Herod, who was called Herod the Great because he built the temple, that's the only reason, He's called that, but he had all the male children in Bethlehem vicinity killed when the prophecy came that the king is to be born. And, and, and so that's, that's Herod the Great. Now, Herod's grandson is Herod Antipas. And just to kind of put it in perspective for you, Herod killed his own son, the father of Herod Antipas, when Herod Antipas was four years old. And so imagine having your grandfather kill your dad when you're four. That's that's what happened to this this guy. And immediately after his dad was killed, his mom shipped him off to Rome, where he ended up with a best friend. And his best friend would become Emperor Caligula. Now, for those of you that know history, he's one of the most insane and immoral emperors that Rome ever had. Well, this was the best friend of Herod Antipas. And he appointed Herod back to govern, basically, Judea and Samaria. And so here he is. Now, now... Now, Caligula had been murdered. He he was assassinated three years prior to this event in Acts chapter 12, but Herod Antipas kept his power. Now, he was, as you might imagine, he was power hungry. Uh, He would do anything he could to to gain popularity points, and that's what he's doing here. He doesn't have a religious agenda. He's not against the Christians per se. He's actually trying to drum up popularity, and so he decides to attack the Christian church and to arrest and kill James, and now he's arrested Peter. Go to verse 4 with me as we continue on. 
It says, after arresting Peter, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Now, the public trial was just a stage. He wanted to kill Peter. Everybody knew it. And so here's what's happening. Here's what's going on. And Peter is guarded by 16 men. And so there's 16 people guarding around the clock Peter because Herod says, I don't want anything to happen to this. And, and as you know, something's going to happen. So go to verse 5. So all this is going on, but listen to verse 5 and underline, if you, if you underline your Bible, verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And so understand, all this is happening. You've got this massive storm with famine and persecution starting up. You, you've got kind of an insane ruler who is uh, best friends with Caligula, and he's almost as insane as Caligula. And he doesn't mind killing people just it, it, on a whim. And now he's persecuting the church. And so you've got all this happening and all this going on. What does the church do? The church decides to pray. Now, what is your response when storms come? And I think it's important for you to answer that because, you know, when a storm hits, let, let's say you go through a storm, all of a the sudden there's this, there's this huge relational storm or health storm or financial storm, what's your first impulse? Notice that the first impulse of the church wasn't to lobby the politicians. You know, they didn't say, okay, we've got some politicians that are favorable to our cause. Let's go lobby the politicians. They didn't do that. You know, it wasn't to try to gain popular opinion. They didn't say, okay, you know what? The, the popular opinion is turning against us. How can we get a good PR campaign out there and change how people see us as Christians? What do we need to do to do that, you know? And so they didn't get together and brainstorm how to have a PR campaign. They didn't do that. They, they also didn't say, you know what, if they're arming themselves against us, let's arm ourselves against them. You know, what's to keep us from taking up the sword? And let's go ahead and march on his palace. Let's assassinate the guy. Let's, let's start a revolution. But they didn't do that either. No, notice what the church's first response says. I, instead of trying to move to political power or instead of trying to change popular opinion or instead of trying to levy physical force, they pray. And that's what they do. They, they, they pray. That's, that's what they do first and, and, and foremost. And that's all they do. They say, well, God, we don't want to handle this with our power. We are praying to you that you might move in us. You know, many of us, if we get honest, we live prayerless lives, and we live lives devoid of the power of God. And God's presence hasn't yet come into our marriage. And God's presence has not yet influenced our workplace or our classroom or our neighborhood or our environment or that situation because we're still busy trying to, with our own power, handle things our way. And we're still trying to, instead of praying first, we're trying to use force first or we're trying to somehow change opinion first instead of coming to God in the storm and praying. But what God wants is he wants us to, first and foremost, seek him and come to him and bring our concerns to him and bring our anguish to him as we are in the midst of the storm. Now notice how the church prayed. Before I move on, I want to give you five words to write down because if you're in a storm and God is calling you to pray, write down these five words because you need them. The first word is first. They prayed first. They prayed as a first resort, not a last resort. They prayed first. Secondly, they prayed anyway. You know, this is important for us to see because the fact of the matter is, is that you know they prayed for James, but James was still beheaded. Some of us, we struggle in praying because we prayed before and it didn't work. We say, well, God, I prayed before that you would intervene and you didn't intervene, so what's the use? You know, I, I, I was still in the storm, and so why should I pray now? But the fact is, and I'll, I'll come back to this on answered prayer, the fact is, is God says, I want you to pray anyway, even if you feel let down by me. And some of us need to hear that today. If we feel let down by God, we pray anyway, because that's exactly where the church is. Feeling let down, but nonetheless praying. Thirdly, they prayed together. Notice that they gathered together for prayer. And what we're going to see is they gathered together in the home of a young man named 
John Mark and his mom and the author of the Gospel of Mark, and they gathered together around the clock. Differing people gathered and prayed around the clock in that house for Peter's release. They prayed continually. They kept praying over the course of several days. As a matter of fact, they were going to keep praying until they had an answer. And they did keep praying until they had an answer. And then they prayed specifically. Specifically, they're praying for Peter. Now, they're not saying, God, here's exactly what you want to, I want you to do. But they're just saying, God, move. Do whatever you would in this situation. And that's what they're praying. So they're praying first. They're praying anyway. They're praying together. They're praying continually. They're praying specifically. Keys in praying. God says, here's what I want you to do when you're in a storm. I want you to pray in this way. I want you to move into that relationship with me through prayer like this. So what, what do we do when the storms come? First of all, we pray for God's protection. Secondly, what we do is we receive God's peace. So, so uh, j- just kind of envision what Peter's going through. He is being guarded now for, for day and night by a group of four soldiers that rotate in and out. He is never alone. He's always got four armed guards with him. How is he feeling? He knows that James was killed. He knows that Herod wants to kill him. And he knows that Herod is waiting for Passover to end. And Passover is about to end. There, there's a day left. And he's been stuck in this jail now for quite some time. And how is Peter feeling? How would you feel if you knew that you might be executed in the morning? I mean, just kind of think through that for a minute because that's the context for verse 6. So go to verse 6. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial. And by the way, this was just a mock trial, kind of like Jesus's, because they, they intended to kill him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping. Just, just get this. He was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. And sentries stood guard at the entrance. And so what's Peter doing on the night before he's knowing they're going to kill me? Is he's sound asleep. Now, would you be sound asleep if you knew that you might get executed in the morning? I mean, just, just think about that. How is he sound asleep? That's a question I've got. How is he, how is he not in a full-blown panic? How is he not just eaten up with anxiety over what might happen in that next day? But he's not. Now, I want to take you back in the Gospel of Mark. I won't read it to you, but, but I'll, I'll quote one of the verses. When Jesus is with his disciples at one point on the Sea of Galilee, and this horrible storm comes over the sea, and, and the disciples are all in a boat, and Jesus is in the boat, and it says Jesus was asleep in the boat. You know the story? It's Mark chapter 4 and the 36, 37, somewhere around there. Jesus is asleep. And the disciples are really mad. And they wake him up and they say, don't you care that we drown? You know, don't you care? Why are you sleeping in this storm? You know, why? You know? And they wake him up and Jesus said, he wakes up, sits up, stands up and says to the storm, peace, be still. And immediately the whole storm drops and goes away. And then Jesus looks at his disciples and says, Why are you so afraid? Do you still lack faith? Let me just just say that again. Why are you in a panic? Why are you so worried? Why, Why are you just so desperate? Do you still lack faith? And what Jesus is doing in this storm in Mark chapter 4 is he's showing his disciples that there's something correlated between faith in him and a peace that you and I have in the storms. And that's 15 years later what Peter is is tapping into. 15 years later now, those words of Jesus ringing in Peter's head, peace be still, why are you so afraid? Why are you in a panic? Do you still lack faith? Peter doesn't lack faith anymore. Peter has grown in the storms. He's in the middle of this storm, and he can sleep calmly because he understands who Jesus is. He understands Jesus has the power to calm the storm if he wants, and he understands that if he doesn't calm the storm, he'll calm him. And so Peter is in the middle of this storm, and he's sleeping soundly. So soundly, we're going to see the angel actually has to hit him to wake him up, but we'll get there in a moment. 
So Jesus says this to us in our storms as well. He says, why are you so worried? You know, do, do you ever stay awake at night just worrying, anxious about stuff? You know, Jesus says, why are you so worried? And then he ties it to that last part. Do you still lack faith? Well, how does he grow our faith? Well, he gets us in a storm. That's how he grows our faith. So if you're in a storm, you know, practice the presence of Jesus in your life. Where, where you're able to say, you know what, I, I need to find your peace in the middle of my storm even right now. Practice that presence of Jesus. Now we see lots of hurricanes coming our way, especially this time here in Florida. And if you look at the hurricane, you can see a Category 5 hurricane, say, over the Atlantic, making its way to Miami or someplace. And wh what you don't know is that this raging hurricane that is so disruptive on the surface of the ocean, if you just go down 25 feet, just 25 feet under the surface of the ocean, there is perfect calm. Nothing's moving. It is complete calm. The fish, the sharks, the dolphins, you know, whatever else is down there, completely unfazed by the hurricane. And I think God is showing us through nature that where there is depth, there is peace. And Jesus is telling us the same thing. Where you have depth in me, there is peace. When you have depth in me, you have peace. When, when you anchor deep in me and hope in me, you can have peace in the midst of any storm. And that's the point. And that's what Jesus is showing his disciples in Mark 4 when he's asleep in the boat during the storm. That's, that's what he has taught Peter. Where there is depth, there is peace. Peter learned what Paul later wrote about in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Let, listen to what Paul later writes. He says, do not be anxious, worried about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And what's going to happen when you and I pray first and, and, and find our depth in Jesus first? What's going to happen? He goes on to say this, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Here, here's what he says is going to happen. If you, if you pray in the midst of the storm, instead of worrying, instead of moving toward anxiety, and find depth in Christ as you communicate with him, as you anchor deep in him, the peace of God which passes all understanding. What does that mean? It means that you cannot rationally explain it. It means that you will have a peace that you, that you say, I have no idea why I've got this peace. I have no idea. I'm, I'm going to get executed in the morning, but for some reason I'm at perfect peace. I have no idea what's happening. Well, the peace of God is guarding Peter's heart and mind in Christ Jesus. That there is something going on there. And, and, and notice that this peace isn't in the absence of the storm. That this, it doesn't say, and the storm will pass. It says, if you do this, the storm may still be there, but God will give you a peace in the midst of the storm and will calm you in the midst of it all. There will be a depth that you will experience in the midst of the storm. And then look at the word guard. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. Now, I think this is an interesting word because it's the same word for the guarding of Peter in that jail cell. It's a military word. It means to stand guard over with armed, as an armed guard. And the peace of God will stand as an armed guard over you is what this is saying. In, in other words, the peace of God is going to protect you emotionally, it's going to protect you relationally, it's going to protect you physically, even your body, it's, it's going to protect you spiritually, it's going to stand guard over you as you anchor yourself in prayer to Jesus. Receive God's peace. Verse 7 continues. So suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared. So remember, Peter is chained between two guards, and then there are two guards right outside of the door as well. And so there are four armed guards that are all awake at this point, you know. <laughs> and, and it says that suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. That means to hit him hard. Have you ever been, uh, someone ever had to hit you hard to wake you up? I mean, how sound do you have to be sleeping for someone to have to hit you to wake you up? That's how soundly Peter's sleeping. The angel 
hits him and wakes him up, and he still doesn't even know he's awake, and we're going to see that in a moment. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. And so here, something miraculous starts to happen as the church prays, as Peter finds his peace in Jesus, something miraculous starts to happen. So what do we do when the storms come? Well, we pray for God's provision. We receive God's peace. Thirdly, we expect God's power. Expect God's power. There was a story that came out in the newspapers a couple decades ago, and it was about a, a nightclub, and it was kind of one of those shady nightclubs that, where, where shady things were, were intended to happen that, that was being built about two blocks away from a church. And the church got wind that the nightclub was building two blocks away, and so they decided, we're going to pray against the nightclub. And so they did, and they started praying that the nightclub wouldn't get built and, and, that, and that the nightclub would ultimately not, not succeed. And, and so they, they kept praying. They actually had prayer vigils at the church, and the nightclub was built anyway, and it was almost ready to open. It had an electrical fire, and the entire nightclub burned to the ground. The whole thing just burned completely to the ground. This is a true story. Well, the owner of the nightclub, knowing that the church had been praying against that club, decided to take them to court and sue them and said they caused this. And, and, and the church said we had no part of it, you know? And so, so the, the statement from the judge, as the story goes, was this. The judge made a statement and said, it seems that what we have here is a nightclub owner who believes in the power of prayer in a church that doesn't. I, I, I love that story because, because here the church is backing off saying, you know, I, I, I have nothing, we have nothing to do with this. You know, God, God didn't do this in response to us or, or whatever they were saying. But there wasn't an expectation for God to move. Not, not really. You know, when we pray, there's often the same thing. We pray almost as a way of saying, well, God, I hope this works. You know, I'll just, I'll try this, you know. But understand that when you and I pray, God always answers, always answers. And I'll, I'll tell you in just a minute how God always answers our prayer. But the fact of the matter is that the church here doesn't yet know that fully. And so what we see here in the ensuing verses is a bunch of people, including Peter, who absolutely didn't expect God to move. They, they absolutely weren't looking for it, and they were completely caught off guard because God answered prayer. And, and, and God is wanting to teach them, I want you to expect me to move in some form or fashion. And so go with me to verse 8. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. The angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but had no idea what the angel was doing or what was really happening. happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. He had no expectation at all that God was going to deliver him. And so when God does deliver him, he doesn't even know what's happening. Get, get that. Verse 10. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself. And they went through it. When he had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt the Lord has sent his angel to rescue me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people would hoping, were hoping would happen. Now I know without a doubt that God has rescued me. He had, he had no idea or inkling before God actually delivered him that God would. It, P Peter had no expectation that God was going to actually answer his and the church's prayer. He, he didn't expect it. You know, and, and, and we, we need to see that, but, but there's something about this as well. Not only did he not expect God to, to, to move and to answer prayer, but the fact of the matter is, is, that, is that he didn't do a thing to help God. You know, sometimes you and I think, okay, I'm going to pray. Now I'm going to go try to help God out. Nobody helped God out. You know, when God really answers prayer, it's not going to be because of our effort. It's not, be, it, it's not going to be because you got wise and started, you know, all of a sudden scheming a plan. God, God's going to do it over and above anything we can do. And we need to be expecting that miraculous intervention of God. Uh, and that's what the church isn't doing. Well, go to verse 12 with me. When this had dawned on Peter, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. Now, that's the author of the Gospel of Mark, his mom, uh, where many people were gathered and were praying. P 
Peter knocked on the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was overjoyed. And she ran back without opening the door and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. So here she hears Peter's voice, but she's not expecting Peter, so she doesn't open the door. She just runs back in the house. So Peter's not expecting it. Rhoda's not expecting it. Verse 15, the church isn't expecting it. Here the church says to Rhoda, I've heard Peter's voice, and the church says, you're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting it was so, they said, it must be an angel, but Peter kept knocking. And when they opened the door, they saw him, and they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell James, that's the brother of Jesus, and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said. And then he left for another place. So no one was expecting God to move. Just get that for a moment. Peter didn't. Rhoda didn't. The church didn't. They were praying, but they weren't expecting because God is showing them in this storm that he always answers prayer. And God wants to show us the same thing. He says, you know, I'm always going to answer your prayer. And, and, and just jot down four ways that God always answers prayer. It's with the, it's, it, it, maybe his answer is no. And that was the answer with James. They prayed for James, but James was still killed. You know, and when there is a no answer, we just, we have to trust God in that. But sometimes it's a no. Sometimes it's a yes. Here the answer was yes. And immediately, Peter is delivered from in the midst of guards from this jail. And the answer was yes, miraculously. Or sometimes the answer is wait. You know, Abraham prays and two decades later he gets an answer, you know. And, 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 or something like that. And God has somebody wait. But whenever somebody waits, it's always a prolonged storm to help shape them and to help shape their character. And then sometimes God's answer is yes, but let me do it differently. You know, I think they're praying that somehow Herod's mind would change. But instead of, instead of Herod's mind changing, what does God do? He busts Peter out of jail. You know, you got jailbreak going on instead of Herod's mind changing. I think that's where the church was focused. Lord, change Herod's mind. Well, God didn't change Herod's mind, but God busted Peter out of the jail. So sometimes God answers differently than what we would ask. Now, let me just say this in conclusion. Faith isn't trying to muster up the confidence that somehow God will answer our prayer the way that we expect. Some of us... You know, and I've heard some pastors say this, well, just name it and claim it, and God's going to give it to you exactly the way you claim it. No, God doesn't exist for us. We exist for him. And we need to understand that when we come to God in prayer, we leave that with God, and God answers in the way he sees fit. And we have to understand that. You see, faith isn't trying to somehow muster up the confidence that God will answer in the way we want. Faith is trusting knowing that God will answer us in the way he sees best. And that's what faith is. It's trusting God in the midst of the storm. It's expecting he's going to answer. I just don't know how. He's going to answer. I just don't know how. You know, every time I do weddings, I, I ask the couple who's getting married, I say, okay, you're going to have 50 to 200 people here at this wedding, and we're all going to be praying for you. What can we ask for? Let, let's say God's going to answer anything that we ask. What can we ask for? You know, what, what is it that we should ask for? And, and, and it's like a light dawns. You know, can, you know, can this really happen? Yeah, we're going to have a couple hundred people praying for you that day, and we're all going to pray in agreement. What should we be asking for? We should be expectant that as we pray together and as we pray, God is going to answer. God will move. God will do tremendous things. So... Let's, let, let's recap. What do you and I do if we're in the storm? Well, we pray for God's provision. We receive God's peace. We expect God's power. And then lastly, we trust in God's plan. And, and we have to. And here's where we have to leave prayer to God. Okay, God, I don't know how you're going to answer this, but I know you will. And even if it's a no answer, I'm good with that because I know that you're in charge. But, but however you answer, I'm going to run with that. And God, thank you 
because I'm going to trust in your plan. So go to verse 18 and on with me. So in the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him, he did not find him. He cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Now this goes back to the kind of character Herod was. So you've got 16 guards here, 16 men, with probably 16 families, with how many of her kids they each have, and he decides, I'm going to execute every one of them now, and he does. He has every last one of these guards executed. I mean, this, this is, he's, a, he's a horrible man, and, and this is the kind of person he is, kind of like his grandfather a bit. And, and so that happens. Then Herod, continuing on in verse 19, went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. After securing the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for the food supply. Verse 21, on the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted as he's speaking. They all shouted, this is the voice of God, not a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. So, so here, here's, here's what's going on. But why didn't God strike Herod down when Herod killed James? I mean, he struck him down here when he didn't give glory to God. At, you go back to Pharaoh, for example. Why did God give Pharaoh in Exodus so many different chances to actually repent? Because God loved Pharaoh. You know, so, sometimes we forget as we read through this story that God loves Herod Antipas. And he keeps giving him opportunities to, to come to him and to repent but, but yet he continues to resist and continues to resist, and finally God moves in Herod's life. But, but just as God is shaping the church here in Acts chapter 12, God is also drawing Herod onto Pas to himself, but he won't come. And he continues to give him opportunities until finally here he's eaten on the inside by worms. That's kind of gross. And, uh, and so all that happens. So, so the start of, of Acts chapter 12, you've got a storm. You've got famine and persecution, and it sounds horrible. And if you're living in the middle of that storm, you think, this is it. We're, we're all dead. We're, we're, you know, nothing, nothing good is going to come of this. That's at the beginning of Acts chapter 12. At the end of Acts chapter 12, go to verse 24 with me, and here's where we read these words. All this happened, Herod died, but the word of God continued to spread and flourish. So, so in the beginning of Acts chapter 12, it looks like all is lost. But the church prays. And Peter finds peace in Jesus. And, and, and God moves in power. And then God's plan unfolds. And at the end of chapter 12, the church is on the move. Herod is dead. That persecution is over. They are going to move into a famine, but they will weather the famine. And more so than that, they have become mature, more mature in the midst of these storms. So here's where I just want us to end. What, what storms are you in today? I mean, it could be that you're in a storm that's 13 hours long, or maybe it's 13 days long, or maybe it's 13 years long, like Paul and Joseph and David. Are you in a storm today? The, the question I would ask you is this. Are, are, you, are you leaning into God? in this storm? Are you able to say, God, here's what I now need to do? You know, I, I need to, I need to pray. I, I need to dive into you and pray for your provision. I need to receive your peace. I need to expect your power. I need to trust in your plan. And so I just want us to end by, by answering that question. I'm going to ask you whether you're at home or here in the room just to respond and, and respond by standing. And just say, you know what, I'm in a storm, God, here's what I need. And what I want to do, whether you're here in this room or at home, is I want to pray for you. And I'm going to ask everyone else who is going to remain seated to pray for those who are standing, pray for those at home who are standing, and let's pray that God would strengthen us in the middle of storms. 
So if that's you, would you stand as we close? Father, right now I pray for all those in this room and all those at home who have just stood to their feet and who are joining us. Lord, you, you, you see us all. You know all of our situations. Lord, we are standing because we're saying, I'm in a storm. And we're inviting you to, to grow us and shape us in the midst of this storm. And for those of us that aren't standing, Lord, we pray for those that are. And we pray that you would mold and shape each person that's standing in the midst of the storm that they're in. Lord, for these that are standing, we pray for your provision. Father, I pray that they would give up on any effort of their own to, to move in this storm and that they would pray first and that they would say, God, meet me in the midst of this. God, do in me whatever you want to do during this storm. And I pray, Lord God, that even now as, as we pray together that you would grant them a peace, that you would guard their hearts and minds with your peace that passes all understanding. And Father, I, I expect that there will be some miraculous things coming of this time of prayer and that you will be moving in individual situations and in individual lives. And we will give you the glory for that. And Father, ultimately we trust in your plan. We know that no matter how hard and how strong the storms rage in our lives, that you are Jesus, the Lord of the storm. And that in you there is peace, and in depth in you we can have calm no matter what rages in our life. So, Father, may we learn together the lesson of the storms. In Jesus' name we pray.